Okay, uh, welcome to the second theory lecture from Young Researcher. It's my pleasure to introduce Fabrizio Renzi, uh, who works at the University of Leiden, and that will uh, discuss uh, about techniques for statistical analysis of cosmological data. Thanks, William. So, hi, everybody. Um, so, this lecture is to introduce uh, some techniques for statistical analysis that we use. Uh, commonly in cosmology to, to understand, uh, to, to, to infer uh, cosmological parameter and in general parameter of a theory um, from the data. And the idea of this lecture is, is born from the fact that analyzing data is starting to be, it's an interplay between uh, modeling the physical theories that, uh, that, that describe the data that you want to, to, to fit and using complex statistical uh, tool to extract information from, uh, from the data themselves. Um, so, in the era of precision cosmology, uh, data analysis has become a key tool to, to, to falsify physical theories, and in the quest for finding new physical effects that uh, are not predicted by our current modelization of the universe. Inevitably, this, this, um, this procedure of, uh, of uh, analyzing data and uh, modeling the theories introduce biases into the, the results that we get. So far, what, what one should be... Um, should be very careful in it's how we interpret uh, the statistical result that we get in terms of the the model that we 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 tailor and uh, the theories that is underlying so in these two series of lecture i will show you how i will introduce first uh, um, uh, i will give first an introduction about monte carlo markov chain and machine learning technique and and uh, and then i will show uh, their advantage and disadvantage, and how we can use them to extract information from the data themselves. So, in this first lecture, um, will be we I will dedicate the time I have to introduce the building blocks of statistical inference, and we will start out. I, I tailored this as a journey through trying to uh, to fit the line, basically. So, the simplest model that you can imagine is a linear model. So, even though this uh, it's not uh, uh, in in real world, this is not the case typically. So. Very few are the cases in which you can fit a line to data. Um, fitting a line will still give us the opportunity to introduce all the uh, uh, all the features of statistical analysis and discuss what are the uh, the drawback and the shortcomings of what we are doing. So let us start um, by understanding. So by generating the data themselves. Um, so we generate the data. From uh, from uh, we really, we 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 start by creating a, a synthetic realization of this data based on the functional shape of a line. So basically, this is the equation epsilon equal to mx plus b. And what we want to do is to use that analysis to infer back from the data the values of b and m and their 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 uncertainties. To do so, however, um, we we cannot just uh, uh, put two, two values of M and B and, uh, and parameterize the, the, the line because real data comes with error. So we also need to include errors in this, in this situation. And for the time being, uh, for the reason that will be understood a bit later in the lecture, what we do is uh, show it, it's creating this data with, with the fraction. So where we, we will uh, create this data, but we will assume that the uncertainty that are coded for the data are, are lower than what the real uncertainty are. And this, this, um, the, the error are lower by a fractional uncertainty that we know. And we want to reconstruct all the information that we include in the data by using that analysis. So um, we, we will include the error already on the y and not on the, on the x, because the error on the x, uh, it will only make uh, the confusion between model more, more prominent and will not really be important for the, for the, re for the reconstruction of M and B. Uh, and this is because basically the line, it's an it's a increasing function. We know that the derivative should, should be positive, let's say, or negative, depending on the slope. And so this will only increase the confusion that we have been describing the model, but we will not impact the, the consideration of MMB. So we start by generating the data. This is our data set. And as you can see, we choose between the infinite set of line that, that is described by the equation, we choose a particular representation, which is uh, described by, by this value of M, B, and F. Um, so F is the fractional, it's the fractional, um, it's the fractional uh, uncertainty that we include as, a, as an additional error. 
And uh, as you can see, what happened is that the, the line, the, the, the fiducial line is this uh, orange line. And uh, what, what happened is that basically when we include the, um, these, these, these fractional error uh, parameterized by F true, the, the points are scattered around the line, but in a completely, in a complicated way as you can see. So there are outliers, there are points that have bigger uncertainty than others, and so on and so forth. This will complicate the, the, the problem of uh, fitting back the line because uh, we, need to assume, we need to assume some kind of model to fit this, this line. And, uh, and this, this, this uncertainty in the error will, uh, will, um, will buy us what we, what we have. So the first things one can do to fit the line, so the, yes, yes. So what I'm quoting as error bars here are, are only the error that I, that I included in the line, which is basically some random, uh, some random number here. So it's just this, it's some random value of the error. So I'm, I'm assuming that the error is some uh, alpha of the, so this, 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 um, this function here, uh, it's a random Gaussian. So I'm just assuming that the error is Gaussian and it's, uh, ah, so basically what we are assuming is that, uh, so if, if you start with a line that is like this, we will assume that the error on Y, it's something like 0 0.1 plus uh, minus 0 0.5 for the Gaussian, 0, 1. Okay. So basically we are scattering the, 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 the point of the line, the mean of the point by, sorry, we are scattering the, the line with this error. But then we also assume that there is an additional error, which is f times the, the f time y, multiplied again for n. But then we got this as the uncertainty, okay? So the uncertainty is, uh, so basically the mean that we get from this, for the points, is different from the real mean in general. Of course, if I do a, a large number of generation of this data, in the end, I will get the right mean, but I do only one generation. So in the end, I get a, a biased mean. For the, for the points. And this creates already a problem because then I try to refit this, no? So let's imagine the simple case in which I remove F, F is zero, then all the points are on a line, no? And then I can use the least square to solve the problem because it's the mathematical solution for the problem. Why? Because I can, I can basically write uh, the equation of fitting the line as, as a matrix equation. So as a system of linear equation, basically, in which the, the Y matrix contains all the, the points of my data set. The A, it's the, gener it's the generative matrix of the, of, the, of the X, and X contain only the parameter. So you can see already that the problem is over, uh, it's overfitted because I have more equation than the points, I, the, the, the parameter I want to, to constrain. So I need to reduce the dimensionality of this. And with the linear algebra, I can do this quite easily because I have the errors and I, and I know this matrix. So I can just multiply both sides by the inverse of the covariance matrix of the data, which is it's basically a diagonal matrix in C. Of course, you can also include covariance, but for the time being, we are not interested in this. It's just an example of the simplest mathematical of the simplest way of solving this in, in mathematics. And as you can see, you can, um, <clears throat> you can find the solution for X by basically uh, solving the above equation once you multiply each side for C for the inverse of C and then you reduce the dimensionality by by multiplying both sides by by the transverse by the transpose of the matrix A. This reduces the dimensionality and gives you the solution of X. So this is the only mathematical correct solution if this if it's if there is a condition that is satisfied so basically that the error that I'm quoting are only they are, are superimposed to the line later on the generative process. So first I generate the, the point, and then I only see, I only assume that the scatter is Gaussian and it's, and it's the, the sigma y that we included before. This can be, uh, so I'm not showing why, but basically this x is what minimizes this function, which is an objective function, it's called the chi-square, and it's basically a distance within the, the data point and some functional representation of the point itself, which is what I consider is a line. So you can write the, the guy square like this, and, and you can see that if you, if you minimize this, you basically get this solution for X. Um, so we can do this, but if we do this, you see, this is the solution what, that we get. So 
if we do this, the least square fail to get the intercept basically. So what we found is that the solution to this, uh, to this, uh, to this problem is biased because the least square assume that basically the, the solution to the, the distance from the function, it's a Gaussian shaped uh, objective function. So, but this is the only correct solution that we have. And you see, uh, apart, so basically this is the, the correct solution for the problem, but it's only valid up, up to this assumption. But we know this is not true. So what we need to do is uh, it's to, it's to create this. Uh, so what we want to do is it's to have a way to, to, to improve this fit in order to, to, to take into account the fact um, that, uh, that the, the fit could be good or not. So basically what we are not doing, it's not, uh, so the, the problem with the least square is that we are calculating the guy square, we are minimizing it, but we are not using it to understand if the fit is good or not. So what we can do is to introduce a, a different way to create the, so the guy square is also an objective function. So the problem of minimizing, uh, so the, the problem of the least square, uh, of the ordinary least square, it's basically a problem that minimize, that try to solve the, the fit by minimizing an objective function. But we can create more complicated objective function. And a way to do so, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's basically to, to take uh, into account another, another fact in, in, generator, in the generative process of creating this data. So, so imagine that really the data come from a line and then um, the only reason that on, the only the point deviate from a perfect line is that they have some, some, Gaussian, uh, some Gaussian uncertainty in the Y direction that is parameterized by the Gaussian that I introduced there. So in this, in this case, if I imagine to, to do this, this generative process of creating the data, I can define a function that define the probability of getting a point in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an infinitesimal range of Y, basically. This, this creates this, this function here, which is typically called the frequency, the frequency distribution for Y. And basically it tells you uh, in an hypothetical set of repeated experiments, give the expected frequency of getting a value in the infinitesimal range between Y and Y plus the Y. So basically it tells you how many points of your data will fall into this value of Y per unit the Y. So this gives us the possibility of creating a more complicated objective function by assuming this fact. So all the, so what we want to do, it's, uh, it's still to minimize this color objective, but now for all the data, instead of creating a, a set of linear equation, we, we, we can assume, and this is quite true, that all the, the, the frequency distribution for all the points are independent, so we can multiply them. And the product of this will be what, sorry, what we call the likelihood. So the likelihood is the, the likelihood of the parameter that generate the model, in this case, a line. And what we can see is that if we take the logarithm of this, we get a constant minus half the guy square. So you can see that what we first introduced as a, as a sort of a, a phenomenological representation for the least square, it's now very well defined in mathematics. So what I mean with this is that minimizing this function mean to max, maximizing L, mean minimizing the logarithm of M. So it means minimizing the guy square. So basically what we, are, what we are saying now is that what we did first with the least square can be done in this sense by minimizing a function that represents the frequency distribution of all the, our point. Um, so this, this, this solution has a, a, a Bayesian generalization in which we can, we can, um, um, so the, the, the Bayesian generalization for a, generator, for a generative model of parameter uh, theta describing functional behavior of standard D can be written like this. And this is basically what we've written here, but now I promoted, uh, so now I, I call D the vector containing the data and theta the vector containing the parameter or the generative model if you want. So you can see, so here there are more terms than what we had here. And the reason is that uh, the Bayesian version of this, the Bayesian generalization tell us that the conditional probability of the, of the parameters given the data is given by the conditional probability of the data given the parameter, which is our likelihood, multiplied by these two functions. 
the first, the P of T, that it's also called uh, the, the prior, and it contains all the information that we know a priori about the generative model. So in principle, we can include, typically you want to include uh, an informative prior, but in general, you, if you know something about your theory that it's not included in the data, you can, you can include more information and then bound the data with, with prior information. This number, this, this function here, it's typically called the evidence and it's the probability uh, of measuring the data vector D. We will see later that in the method that we typically use, this can be removed. And also you can see it from here because the likelihood is defined up to a constant. And typically this is a, just a constant and you can just renormalize the posterior distribution of the likelihood uh, in terms of, uh, so you can, you can renormalize the likelihood in, and remove the, the evidence basically. What we have on the left side instead, it's called the posterior, and it's basically what we get by maximizing the likelihood. Uh, so the posterior distribution will tell us what, what's the, so maximizing the likelihood will tell us what is the best fit for the posterior distribution. And then we will also maximize the probability, so we will find the, the parameter that maximize the probability of having the model generating the data. So typically what you want to do instead, instead of just maximizing, um, it's more like sampling the likelihood because sampling the likelihood will tell you not only the best fit, but also the, the confidence interval that you have around this, this posterior distribution, the, the maximum a posteriori value gained from the posterior distribution. But there is a thing to note that in the least square we didn't have, and it's that um, the posterior distribution now depends on the product of the likelihood and the prior. So basically the prior, the prior information can affect significantly the estimation of the posterior probability. And this is a problem one needs to consider because when, when you want to, to, to extract information for the parameter, your prior information can completely wash away uh, the sampling of the likelihood basically. And with wash away, I mean uh, <coughs> that your, your, uh, your result will be biased towards uh, the prior information so far if your data are not constraining enough. Uh, there is also another things to consider is that uh, these things is now, so basically the likelihood, it's a sort of rewriting of the guy square. So this function, the posterior, is weighted by the, by the guy square because at each point we will see in a while, in a moment that uh, the, the, the posterior distribution for the parameter theta, it's closer than the estimation that we did before with the least square of the covariance matrix, which is defined by this combination. So basically by, diagonalizing the covariance matrix in terms of the matrix A. Um, <clears throat> and this is a best way of, so basically we expect that the, the sampling of the likelihood will give us a better representation of the, of, the, of the uncertainty of the point with respect to the least square. Uh, there is also one thing to consider is that, uh, I didn't show you this, but um, basically, the least square it's valid to solve the problem only if we want to measure the slope. And this can be understood from the, the, the plot I showed you before because the slope, as soon, so I told you before that the, the value of X uh, will not be uh, scattered, will not have an error because basically this only uh, create confusion in, in what's the model. And this also mean that in typically the, the least square will solve uh, better for, for M because this is, fixed not by the error, but only by the, the, the way in which the, the coordinate and the Y evolve together. Um, <clears throat> so far, we now want to, um, so how do we sample the likelihood basically? So what we can do instead of, so we, we can include, uh, we, can, we can go into a very complicated statistical set, but before going into this, let's look at a very simple way of doing it. So in two dimension, it's very simple. Because uh, what we can do um, is to create a grid of two of parameters, basically B and M, and reproduce a, a huge number. So basically calculating the guy square given the distribution of M and B. This is the simplest way of doing what it's called a Markov chain Monte Carlo. And basically it, it, it results in this. So what I'm doing here at each, so basically I, I started from two distribution for M and B that are only basically a grid uh, in this space. And for each point of the grid, I calculate the guy square. What happened is that I get this correlation within the two points that it's um, 
it's sort of created by the, the fact that I'm calculating the chi-square. The reason of why I'm getting this is because, so it is interesting first to note these things of the fact that we started from uncorrelated distribution, but then we get um, a distribution that is correlated in the end. So the chi-square correlate the two, the, two, the two parameters. The idea is that, um, the fact is that compared to the least square, the guy square is giving a direction of correlation inside the, 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 the parameter space of MMB. And, and it's telling us that, um, that basically it exists a line on which the, the parameter are fitted better than, than other line, let's say. So there is a direction in, in, the, in the parameter MB that gives better representation of the, of the function that we started from, sorry, of the data we started from. But you see, when I do this, the center of the line, the center of the of the of the guy square, so the the, the the point where the likelihood peak, it's the same where, where it was peaking in uh, in the least square. So basically, the solution I will get minimizing this likelihood, maximizing this likelihood, is the same exact solution of the guys of the least square problem. And here with this two dotted line, I indicated exactly the the the, the least square fitting solution. But there is a things we can do that with the least square we cannot do that is called marginalization, which is basically the procedure of integrating away one of the two parameters to get the marginalized distribution or the probability distribution on only one parameter bounded to the other. This can be done simply by, uh, I brought it here, by integrating away all the parameters we are not, integrating the, the likelihood function over all the parameters we are not interested to, to get only the likelihood of one parameter. <coughs> And we can do, um, so for, for two parameters, this is trivial, of course, because we have only two parameters, so it's a, a one-dimensional integral. But in principle, you can, you can simply, so you can easily generalize it to many, 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 many to an n-dimensional parameter space. Um, the result of this gives us the distribution of M, which, which is this one. And here I show that, uh, uh, so this is, again, this, this line is the, so this line now is the best fit that, so it's the fiducial value basically. And you can see that the likelihood, so the estimation of the likelihood give us a good representation of the fit. So we cannot distinguish if it's good, it's a, if, if our data are in agreement or not with the fiducial model basically. So in principle, we get back the fiducial model up to one sigma or so. And this result show again that the least query it's, it's a good way of measuring the slope because we get exactly the same result and the same error for the least square. But what happened is that B is different because now, so you see that instead B is completely different from what we get before. So for the, for the least square problem, we were getting a very narrow band for B and, uh, and, now, and now we don't get it anymore. The reason is that um, now that we are weighting um, the fit through, through the guy square, the dependency on B is much lower. Um, I will show you. So the dependency on B is much lower. And so the error increase, and now we cannot basically fit P, as you can see. So the error on B is quite large. It's 50% it's, it's of, the, of the mean. So basically it means that whatever is consistent with B. So this, this result will, not, will tell us that basically we are not in, in, so with this model, we are not able to get the, the, the intercept correctly. Um, so the point is that our data and our, so basically our generative model is not good enough to, to get the parameter B correctly. We can improve this, but before I want to show you why uh, the guy square is not sensible to B and why we get this, this large number. So you can imagine B and M as a, as a two dimensional vector. So generate, you can imagine B and M as the vector basis of a 2D vector field. And then basically X is the is the is their sum in this in this uh, in this vector space. So if you do so, you can calculate delta guy in, in, in terms of movement along one of the two directions. So you 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 basically imagine to do a small coordinate transformation in B and M and move in in, in, in a certain direction. If you do so, you can calculate the guy square and if and up to uh, the m square and the b square, you get this solution. And you see 
this depends a lot on the variation of M, but not a lot on the variation of B. This means that if I move a lot on, 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 uh, on the value of M, I'm not moving a lot on the value of B. So basically the guy square change a lot when I move, when I change the value of M and not B. This, make, this, makes, the, <coughs> this makes the guy square more sensible to M and then B it's fitted wrongly, let's say, or, or it's less well fit, it's less accurate, the solution for B. Um, but <clears throat> there is another thing that we can learn, and it's that uh, they can, so you can imagine this in another way. So imagine you know how much you are moving on the guy square and how much you are moving on, on one of the two value. You can get the other way, you, you can get the, the variation of the other value by, by basically doing the differences. No? So this means that any variation of one parameter is weighted on the other by the guy square. And this is the difference with the least square. Because the least square will not weight the solution by looking at the guy square, but will only tell us uh, will, will tell us the best fit without look without being bounded to the goodness of the fit, so to the value of the guy square. Instead, the <clears throat> the likelihood uh, take into account the fact that chi it's uh, it's the goodness of fit, and so if the data if the fit become become so. Uh, with respect to the to the least square where we didn't include this information this, this fact, uh, the likelihood function will tell us uh, will will tell us better. Um, so the, the likelihood function will 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 degrade the result if the goodness of it degrade and vice versa. If the goodness of it improve, the likelihood will get a better solution. So. So far, until now, we have used the wrong solution for the, for the, so we have used the wrong likelihood. So we are basically here, I wanted just to show you that if you still using this, the sampling of the likelihood will not be much better if you don't know exactly the generative model, let's say. So if you don't know exactly what process have generated your data. But here we can see, so what we do now, um, it's including the correct likelihood and maximize another way. So what we do now is it's, it's using the correct likelihood because we know the generative model because fortunately we have it, <laughs> which in reality is never the case. And I will show you that using the correct likelihood we can improve a lot over the parameter. Okay. The problem is that now we cannot do any more the two the two dimensional grid that we did before because moving it because now we need to include the third parameter because now uh, what I do here is basically I didn't define s sorry. Um, so basically. It's still a Gaussian, but now the fractional error are underestimated by the fractional amount that we included at the start. So Sn will be defined as the sum, as the squared sum of sigma epsilon y plus f y at each at each x. So basically we are re-including the, the scatter. There is an interesting thing here that typically when you include more error in your data, then your fit degrade, right? You expect that. But here it's different because we are not including simply an error, but we're including an error that is bounded to the value of y at each point. So basically, this is an additional information. So it's not, we are not including a random error, assuming it's larger and, and that's it, but we are including an error that it's larger but bounded on the functional form that we are including. So basically, this is another information for the, for the data. So we expect in, in, in reality that our solution will be better, will be improved. So that this, even though we are, at, we are including an additional parameter and additional error, actually our fit will be better. Um, <clears throat> and also there is an interesting, so the other fact is that it's not a problem if you're including a parameter because we can always marginalize it the way as, we sh as I showed before. So now the first things we do, it's, it's re, uh, re-maximizing this likelihood. So basically now um, I compare the maximization of the, of the correct likelihood with respect to the least square. And you can see that now the, 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 the maximum likelihood estimate, it's getting almost correct in the line, you see, no? But there is an interesting fact that I signal with this, with this circle. And it's that again, we can show that the slope is correct. So the least square is getting the slope correct and the two line superimpose after a certain point. This means that the functional shape of this, so the, 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 the sorry, not the functional shape, but the, the let's say the correlation within the X and Y over 
at the range of x that I have, fix the slope correctly because this is what fixed the slope, but the intercept is what I, I always fail to get. So again, we found what we, what we saw in the two-dimensional case. But now we want to sample this likelihood. So how do we do? We cannot do, so in two dimension, we, we created the grid, but in three dimension, we have to go to, for example, to move on a sphere or something like that. So it's very complicated and highly inefficient. You can imagine that if I want to do a, a grid in four dimension, this will scale quite fast. If I do 10 points, it will be 10 to the fourth and so on and so forth. So at each, at each step, I will, I, will, uh, I will raise to the power of the dimension, the, the number of points that I want to put in the grid. And this become inefficient quite fast. Even with 10 parameters, it's complicated. Typically in cosmology and other fields, we have tons of parameters. So not only the one of the generative model, but some that describe the experiment itself. So it's very complicated to, to do this. And so what typically one do is to, to use very complicated sampling algorithm that can sample a parameter space of large dimension in a very efficient way. So for the time being, and for this lecture, I will only take into account what it's called Markov chain sampling, which is based on a random, on a stochastic way of sampling the, the parameter space. Um, so Monte Carlo Markov chain method are a class of algorithm for sampling probability distribution. So exactly what we want to do. Um, so what, what we do with the, so a Markov chain, it's basically a process in which you want to reconstruct an equilibrium distribution starting from a random distribution. This is the idea. And, uh, and what you do typically, it's, record, it's, as it's sampling this likelihood by recording the state at each, at each step of the chain. The more steps are included, the more you go towards the equilibrium distribution, the more your solution uh, becomes closer to the, to the distribution of the data. But let's give some definition before going into how this is done, efficient, how this is actually done. Um, so basically a Markov chain or Markov process is, to, is a stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state attained in the previous event. So basically at each step of the chain, you, your point depends only on the previous point, but not on all the T minus N before. Monte Carlo method instead are a broad class of computational algorithms that rely on repeated random sampling to, to obtain numerical result. And the underlying concept is to, to use randomness to solve a problem that is deterministic in principle. So putting together, Monte Carlo Marco Chain are therefore methods that create random sample from a continuous random variable without with probability density proportional to a known function. This is what they do. Um, this sample can be used to evaluate an integral or, or, or uh, over, the over a variable or, it, or its expected value and variance. So what, what we want to do basically. Um, so practically how you do this is generating a large amount of representation of your probability distribution to, to sample the likelihood and create this chain. Uh, but this doesn't solve how you actually walk inside the parameter space. So you also need an algorithm that tells you how to move. And typically what we do in the, in, the, in the cosmological field is to use the Metropolis algorithm, the Metropolis asking algorithm, which is a Marco Chain Monte Carlo method for obtaining a sequence of random sample from a probability distribution with, which, for which direct sampling is it's complicated, like, like a multidimensional probability distribution. Um, and this sequence can be used to approximate the histogram or the probability distribution of the parameter. Um, Despite this complicated definition, actually, the Metropolis asking, it's very simple. And it's based on the idea that a probability, an equilibrium stationary distribution exists at the end of this process. Um, so to define this, um, we need to, to go into other definition. And basically, what we, what we need to define is how uh, a Markov process is created. And Basically, the Markov process is uniquely defined by the transition probability between two states of the chain. Basically, this transition probability needs to have these two conditions, the extension of extensionary probability. That means that, uh, um, that basically it, a sufficient but not necessary condition for this is that the transition between the two, the two values is reversible so that you can go from, from, uh, from x to x first and to x first to x with the same move. 
So the move to go from one to another is the same as to go to, one, to the first to the second. This is, can be written in this equation that basically is again a, re a rewriting of the Bayesian theorem in a sense. And, uh, and the second is the, unique, the uniqueness of the stationary distribution, which basically is assumed already inside the, the definition of the Markov process because uh, we need to assume, so for, for having a Markov process, we need to assume, so we need, we need to have a process that, uh, uh, that every, so basically we need, to have a, we need to have a process that says that every state should be aperiodic so that the, state, the, the system doesn't return on the same state after a certain fixed amount of step. And that, but also that the expected number of steps to return to that state is finite. So it shouldn't be periodic, but it should be finite. So at, at every step, so we take a large number of steps, we expect that we are not return, at, we do not return to the same uh, state as we started, let's say. But at the same time, we know that to go back from that state back to the first, we have a finite number of steps. This is what this, this, this condition means. So, the, the, so basically, your Markov chain is not something that does like this, but it's something that does converge to something, let's say. So it has a trajectory. It's not just a, an oscillation in the parameter space. Um, so to, to, to construct the algorithm, we start from the, uh, from uh, the scratch. So to construct the algorithm, we start from the detailed balance. And now I assume that the, the equilibrium distribution is actually the, the distribution that I want to reconstruct. No? So this is the, the condition that I wrote here. So the existence of the stationary distribution means uh, that I can, I, can, I can assume that pi x is actually p of x. So now I rewrite the detailed balance in this way. Then the, the, typical, uh, the typical way of showing this is to separate this into steps. The first is the proposal of the, of the state, and the second is the acceptance or rejection of the state. So this allows us to write, uh, so basically what we need to do is to rewrite the transition probability in terms of the proposal distribution, which is this G. So we introduce a new function. And the accept and distribution describe instead the probability of proposing and or accepting a new state from the state that we started from. Uh, we therefore can rewrite P of X first X in terms of these two function. And then the, the detailed balance is rewritten like that. So basically the transition is weighted by these two function. Now, the metropolis axiom simply said that the transition probability is actually uh, so basically, we, you need to choose a way of accepting or not accepting uh, state, which are defined by the conditional probability and this A. And the metropolis accept a radio A assume that basically A, A X, X, Y is one or either X, one, X is one. So that you can write this in this way and the condition is always satisfied. You can see, however, that there is, so but, this is just the, the mathematics behind. So how, how it is done in principle. So it's more easier to understand how it works if we do it, if we try to, to actually create the algorithm. Basically the algorithm works in this way. You pick an initial state should, taken from the prior distribution of your parameter. This is a random point that you choose. Then you generate uh, a random candidate x, y according to, to, the, to the proposal distribution. Then you calculate the acceptance probability as, as this, uh, as the minimum of one and the, and the transitional probability. And you generate then, once you have done this, uh, you generate the random number between zero and one. And if the generated number is smaller than the, trans, than the acceptance probability, then you, you accept the state and you go forward. If it's not, you reject the state and you, you continue from the initial state and you, re, you re-extract another point. And then you iterate until you get the convergence. So there, as you can see, there are pros and cons of this. And the pros is this, the final result is independent of the likelihood normalization. So the evidence that we, so it's, it's independent of P of the data. So the probability of getting the data, it's independent of the process. Uh, this avoid expensive computation, but you cannot use these methods to compare to different models because you don't have the evidence. This is typically used uh, for that. But the marginalization is also trivial because basically you're accumulating only states. So marginalizing is not an integral, but simply 
taking uh, the histogram of one parameter and removing all the others. There are cons though, and uh, the first is that the initial point is completely arbitrary. So if you start very far away from the center of the likelihood, you may, you may end up going around and around your parameter space forever. This is typically account for because this is called the Barin phase. Uh, basically the Barin phase is the time that uh, the algorithm uh, needs to find the correct direction in the parameter space to converge to the correct values or to the, sorry, to the equilibrium distribution. The proposal distribution is also, it's also, <clears throat> it's also arbitrary, meaning that basically um, you, you, if it's too small, like if your, if your condition, if your um, proposal distribution has a too small step, then you can overshoot the peak because basically you can just, uh, you can, uh, you can move too, you can have too small moves and then you can basically not sample the, the parameter space very efficiently. And at the same time, if it's too large, then basically you can, you can just uh, never converge because your movement are too, too big and then you never get the right, the right direction inside the parameter space. So in each case, so these two, these two, these two cons means that you, you need to carefully uh, check your result before, before concluding anything about your parameter space. Uh, what time is it? Should I do a break at a point? How much time? Are you? Okay, okay. Well, but then I can stop here and then we go, we go forward. So uh, we will do a small pause and then uh, we're gonna restart in ten minutes. Five. Uh, okay. um, so as we were discussing, there are pros and cons, but uh, one of the important things to do uh, for the Monte Carlo Markov chain is to establish. So we we show that. In, in with, uh, with an infinite amount of sampling uh, of time and uh, sampling of the posterior distribution, we'll get the right solution. But how we can actually, so we cannot have an infinite time to actually do this. So what we should do is to find a way to understand what's the convergence of our chain. So how, what, what's the point in which we can say, okay, this is my result and, uh, and it's correct, let's say, or, correct, or probable, let's say. So when my algorithm converge. So to do so typically, there are many different ways. Um, the important one, the one that we use the most, or at least the one that I show here, it's, the, it's called the Gamma Ruby statistics. And it basically take into account uh, the fact that, uh, um, it, it take, so it, it, um, it check the convergence by analyzing the difference between multiple chain of the Markov process. So basically, Typically, you don't, you don't use only one chain, but you do multiple chain at the same time to accumulate more and more sample altogether. And, uh, and then you can check the convergence by looking at, at the mean and the, and the variance of the, of the parameters inside the chain. So basically, it's very simple to make it work. And suppose you have a M chain, each of length 10, even though you can have different length of the chain, it doesn't matter, it's just simpler to, to assume they have same length. And, uh, and we choose one parameter, and, um, and, and assume that this is the parameter uh, in the chi in the chain, which has m, m value. Um, so the chain mean and all chain mean, which are basically the mean. So this is the mean inside the chain, and this is the mean in all chain, can be defined like this, simply. And then you can define the higher order statistics, so the variance within chain and so in the chain and between the chain. Then the Gelman, Gelman and Rubin show it that an unbiased estimator of the variance of, the, of this process is basically this combination of the, the two variants. And so the Gelman-Rubin statistic is defined in this way, basically taking the radio of this with respect to W, and you can see W is the, is the in-chain uh, variance. And you can see that when the number of, so this, this actually take into account that when the number of chain increase to infinite, Basically, this goes to, to one. You can see it because this, this goes to one and you, you get, basically this goes away because n goes to infinite. And then you basically get the radio of, of W and this goes to one. So if we can get R equal one, so we can check the statistic and get R equal one, then this is a convergent solution. However, in reality, we don't have an infinite amount. So typically one set the threshold for R and typically you wanted the, for good convergence, let's say this is an arbitrary idea, you can put it wherever, so with the threshold could be whatever. Typically uh, for cosmology, we put this to, to 10 to the minus two. 
So this is typically the threshold that we use. So we will use this in the following to, to set our chain. So I will not show you, so I showed you the mathematics behind, but I'm not showing you how to, to write it, let's say. So I'm using a, a already a sampler that it's tailored for this. So sorry, here there is a lot of trash, a real lot. And you can see, this is the outcome of all the chain that I ran inside the, the problem. So basically this is the statistics, this is the, the, the <laughs> This is the, the chain statistics, let's say. So this is how the, this is actually how the chain evolves inside the, the, the run. So here you can see the number of sample accumulated in terms of the, uh, the acceptance radio. And as you can see, we started from a random point here, the center radio goes up, then it goes down a lot. So meaning that we are going far away from the center. And then with time, increasing the number of sample, slowly the number of acceptance becomes stable and you see the algorithm here, you can see the convergence radio. So the, the bullets are the, 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 exactly the gamma ruby statistics for the mean, while the, the X are for the, for the variance. So you get to, I, to an I, in, this, in this code, you get to an higher order also. So you check the, the convergence is checked twice. First on the, on the mean, which is what I showed you. And then you can just get an higher order and do the variance and the variance of the variance. And so as you can see, when the algorithm converge, so uh, you can see when R minus one, it's smaller than, uh, than the threshold, then you get outside with, a, with an acceptance radio that is fixed. So basically this means that what we assume in the Markov process that we, we get an equilibrium distribution is, is uh, somewhat uh, reconstructed in the statistic of the chain. So basically the chain acquire a, a flat behavior after the number of sample increase enough. Um, but you can see already here that until a certain number of steps of sample accumulated, the, the algorithm struggle to get the correct solution because the correct solution is reached basically when the upset and radio uh, flatten. So this is what I showed you before is the, the, the burning phase. And we can see it not only in the, in the chain statistic, but in each of the chain of the parameter. So here I, I'm plotting a chain and you can see the dots are each step of the chain. And as you can see, if I, so I, I make the chain started from a random value of B that I know it's not correct, but then you see the, the, the Markov chain create this, this process and then it goes to the right direction. But all this part, it's basically merely a problem of the algorithm. It's a, it's a sort of, a, spurious uh, solution of the algorithm that we are not interested in. So we can remove it. And you can see that once I remove the burning phase, uh, once I remove this sample from the, 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 the solution, then the chain is always around the correct mean. So basically the burning phase is, is as I was saying, just a, a mere artifact of the algorithm itself. It's the time it needs to, it's called burning because it's the time it needs to warm up, let's say. Um, and you can see, so, I told you that uh, so samples can be also represented in, a, in, in terms of frequency up to a bin at the, uh, so you basically can be in the value of, of one of the two parameters here I'm representing B. Um, a binning it, you see that the burning phase is some, it's, it's basically biasing your, uh, your result because you have here a sort of accumulation of points that are spurious that you don't want. And if you don't remove it, basically you will, have, you will imagine that here there is a sort of small peak. So typically you want totally to remove it uh, because otherwise you get uh, biased inference. And in this case, for how we tailored the, the Monte Carlo, basically uh, the amount of burning phase is, is, uh, is, is actually the, the amount of the acceptance radio. So we remove a fraction of the, of the sample that is exactly equal to the to the acceptance rate. So 30% of the voids will go away, <laughs> will simply be removed. Um, and now basically uh, once we, we, can, we can also see this uh, on the result itself. So now this is the result and you can see that, so the, the uh, again, it, it's not big enough to show all the thing. Oh, no, okay. Um, 
So you cannot see it, but basically the purple is still with the burning and uh, the, the, the orange is without. And you can see that the burning phase create these blobs that are corresponding to the peak that we see before in the, in the histogram. These things here is realized just integrating the histogram to get the probability distribution because sample and probability are, are exactly the same things. So by integrating the histogram, we get this and you can see that the burning phase create this, this spurious peak that we know it's completely no sense, okay? But there is another thing we can, we, can, we can see. And it's the first thing is that now B it's perfectly satisfied. So basically now that we have the correct model, B it's, it's perfectly uh, constrained by our data. So now that we include, so in this fit with respect to the previous one of the two dimensions of, with two parameters, I included the, the fractional error. No. So I'm, I'm, including, uh, I'm including an additional parameter, which is, a bit biased in the solution, but this creates a better fit for B. So now the intercept is gained correctly because I mean, I'm, I'm using the correct likelihood in a sense. So what we were saying before, even though I'm including additional parameter and this is including additional error, my fit is better because I'm including additional information. So actually the error I'm including, it's, a, it's an information that it's in addition to what I get from the data. Um, so this is, I'm showing you many ways of representing the solution. And probably the most instructive is to look at this. So this is the, so here I'm showing you the true representation of the line and, and the representation of the line that it's gained from taking samples of the chain and representing it uh, by, by calculating the, 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 the line that they, get, that they give us. So basically each of these uh, orange line have different value of M and B inside the posterior distribution. So they're simply taken randomly from the posterior. And you can see there is an interesting fact here that we didn't see before. And is that the fit is bounded only here in the center region where the points are abundant. But as we go far away from the center, then um, the tail, so basically as we go far away from the center, then the fit degrade and this point, uh, so basically what happened is that here we are sure that this, it is a line, but here we are not anymore or we don't know anymore what's the intercept and what's M, no? So this creates a problem because now what happens if I fit a, a, an higher order model like a quadratic model or something else, will I still get this solution or, or will be, so can I, can I understand that it's a quadratic model or not? So sorry, can I understand fitting a quadratic model to the data that it's a linear model instead? And this, then this, the, the answer is no. <laughs> what I do, so now what I do, it's basically, changing the generative model, assuming it's a parabola. So I include another parameter and I do exactly the same. So I re-maximize the likelihood, I run the full Monte Carlo and then I visualize the result again, as we did before. And what happened is that if I compare the quadratic and the linear model, basically here they're equal, but as I go far away from that, then the quadratic model deviates from the linear, but the solution is it's as the same chi square. I didn't show you that. Of course, including more sample would be better perhaps, but the problem is that where do these sample will appear? If they appear still here, then no. If they appear here or here, then yes. But there is another interesting fact. If now I sample all the, the likelihood. So now, oh, sorry, another bunch of trash. So now first let's look at what happened for, for the, only, the, the, the only two parameters that they have in common. So the guy square, and this is the sigma is the, the fractional error. So if, as you see, the solution for these two is equal. So the chi square of the two models is basically the same. It's probably too big, you cannot see all of that. You can see the chi square is not very different from the two. So I cannot say, oh, okay, the quadratic model is just better fit to the, to the linear. And also the, the fractional uncertainty is always the same. So basically <laughs> the confusion, up, but, but the other parameter instead, I cannot, I don't have it here, but. Um, I have to go back, sorry. <laughs> uh, but the other parameter, you see the solution, it's completely different. So these three numbers are completely random. I could get the solution if A is completely zero, but it's not zero. So basically what happened is that I still get similar value for log F, but C, B, and A are completely different from the line. So I, I'm not getting a line back. But, uh, so this thing, uh, it's messy. 
But now let's look at the at this solution. So now let's look at what we showed before, like the plot with the with the data with respect to the, the various representation of the chain. And you can see there is a the, here you can see why the, the quadratic model still fit good this data, because here we still have the same solution. So here is a line, definitely. So there's a, so if I only take this part of the data set, it's a line. There's no reason for, for, for doubting that. But here, no. Here, the quadratic model actually fits better than the outlier because it has more freedom to, to go here, you see? The line was not fitting this point very well. But now the quadratic model is fitting this very well. And also this point could be a very problematic point because the quadratic model is going there, you see? So here we have the quadratic model is going toward this. So the, there is some curvature inside the data, let's say, that is given by the error. So this tells us a very important thing that the error is what, in a sense, gives us more information about the model than the data itself, in a sense. So not, so not the data itself, but the error is data itself, in a sense. But no, no, no. What I mean is that the good parameterization of the error gives more information about the data and the generative model than what the mean gives. So the mean only tells you what's the slope of this, but it doesn't tell you what's the correct model. But if you have a way of getting correctly the error, then you can get the correct model in a sense. But so, until now, so this is extremely important because in theory, we don't know the model, right? So the confusion is a mess. And if we don't know the model and we don't, so imagine you don't have, you don't know the model and uh, you also don't have a very good information about your error, then you can throw away everything. <laughs> so we need to find, so, and the problem, which the problem in Monte Carlo is that you always have to define the likelihood. So actually you are, you are already biasing the problem when you start doing it. So when you start sampling the likelihood, you're already biasing everything. So we can use, a better approach, let's say, better, a more phenomenological, not phenomenological, but let's say a more uh, agnostic approach. And this is given by machine learning. Oh, sorry. So machine learning, it's a, it's a, it's a broad class of, of, of algorithm that basically assume that data analysis can automate the process of model fitting. So basically the data can tell you what's the correct model. How can you do that? Well, you need still to assume something. Eh? But, but these assumptions are more phenomenological, let's say, than it, it's not tailored to the generative model of the data, but on the data themselves, of their correlation or some property that they have as a global ensemble. So far, I will show you only one machine learning technique because there are plenty of it and they're all completely different. So I prefer to analyze one precise model of machine learning, which is the Gaussian process. And Gaussian processes are basically very simple in a sense, because they assume that each of the data set that you have, it's coming, so basically is a collection of random variable, any infinite number of which has a random Gaussian distribution, as a joint Gaussian distribution. So they're described basically by the multivariate Gaussian, okay? But instead of looking at the parameter that generate the model, you look at the function that describes the model. So basically the GP, it's a multivariate in the functional space of the data. So you assume that uh, the GP, the function, is defined as the GP as the mean, the expected value of the function in this space and its covariance, which is called also the kernel. Typically, it, in this kind of situation, uh, one assumes that the mean is zero because we can always remove it, right? So the GP is completely specified by the kernel, typically. So the kernel is the only thing that we, we interested in. And the kernel is no more than, I will write it here. The kernel is no more than basically taking this. So you are basically saying that the covariance of two points in the Y, it's defined by some representation of the covariance of the X. And this is what we want to do now. Basically, we want to show that this can give, let's say, a better solution, or at least a less inform less biased solution. And, um, and you can see that basically, uh, in a sense, this can be taught as a generalization of the, the least square problem, because you are still trying to do a regression fit here. Um, the only thing is that we, we basically, so, 
if you remember the guy square was written so we brought the guy square like this uh, come over here of y no so now instead of parameterizing this we are putting the gp here so we will so the GP will parameterize this part and then we will calculate the guy squared the same way. But now the function is not given by a generative model, but that was some parametric representation in the higher dimensional field. Um, so basically what you do, it's, uh, it's defining this, this guy here that is called the marginal likelihood, which is given by two functions. This is the, the GP function basically, and this is the prior information. The prior is defined still I didn't define it because it's not important for the problem, but you can solve this integral by defining the prior and, uh, and you get this solution, which you see it's dependent on the kernel. So basically your marginalized likelihood depends on the form of the kernel. So you still didn't completely remove the problem of the generative prop of the generative model, but now your generative model is more uh, broad, let's say. So you don't have a, only a representation of one model, but you have many altogether. Of course, there's still some bound. You cannot represent whatever you want, but you can change the kernel form to represent a complicated solution or combine kernels to create more complicated solution. Um, uh, there's one thing I didn't say is that the kernel, it's not only defined by the X and, and by, the, by, the, by, the, by the X, so by the, uh, by the coordinate, but also by some parameters, because of course, uh, you need also some parameters to tune the amplitude and the, and the variance of this thing. And, uh, and typically these parameters are fitted to the data. So this is how the, the, the GP learns what the correct model is by minimizing the marginal likelihood. So we are still doing a Bayesian approach in the end, but a bit more complicated. And instead of sampling the, the, the hyperparameter space, we just minimize them. So we take the best fit for them. Here I wanted just to show you <laughs> what happened if I take two of these. So these are, uh, I, sh I decided to use this because they're the simplest one for this case. And uh, in the next lecture, I will show you more complicated one. <laughs> but for the time being, we are interested in simple solutions. So the first is a, a Gaussian kernel, you can see. And D is the distance between, it's the Euclidean distance between the point in the X space. And this L is the length scale. So basically we are doing a Gaussian, huh? it's the length scale. It's a, it's a number huh? bigger than zero that basically parameterize the variance of this kernel in the higher dimensional space compared to the distance of the point. Uh, of the x and the other one is that is a polynomial you can i cannot so i i didn't put it here the definition of the, the, the derivation of this but you can if you if you try to to calculate that equation for for a line you will get this thing so this is basically the the, the covariance of a line of two point on a line and now what happened if I, so the first things I want to show you is the prior distribution. So we, we started with the Monte Carlo that has a prior distribution that is a flat uh, ensemble of numbers, let's say. But you see in the GP, they are a large ensemble of function. So, and the difference, this is what I was saying before. So the difference with the kernel is quite big here because the, 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 the exponential kernel gives something that is weakly, it's a function. And the other one instead gives something that is a line. So we expect already that this is a better representation of the data than this, right? Because this has some curvature and blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's a, so we can, we can, sh we can see how this, uh, sorry, let's first this. So here I'm also including another kernel because there is a risk. So we, we, we assume it. So if I only fit that kernel, I'm still into the least square problem because I'm still using a Gaussian likelihood, et cetera. So what I do, there is a kernel that can be, so basically, let me get back because there is a things I, I over, I over, uh, I smoothed over. And is that the kernel doesn't have an autocorrelation value. So basically the, the variance of this kernel is zero. You can see it because the distance in, in if x, j is equal x, y is equal x, i, then this is zero, right? So basically it's like the error are not included here the error of the, of the point itself. So we add, we add it by adding basically something like this. And this is called the white kernel. So there is a, a variance that is added to the, to the kernel that I showed you. So these are, to this I sum a, another variance. 
And then basically this variance should represent what we had before in the Monte Carlo with the, the parameter F, the fractional uncertainty that we did and in, with, that we included at the start. And you can see that now that I include this, it is a Gaussian error. So in the end, it's exactly like F. So it's a Gaussian random things that appear on the data. And you can see these are extremely scattered now. No? So before we had a smooth function, but now we have things that scatter a lot. But you see that the solution is quite good, no? but it's curved. So again, <laughs> so again, there is a problem here because in the end it's still curved, but the solution is much better because now the error contains the information that the model cannot be bounded very well outside this, this, this range here. So you see that this kernel would still bound quite well the, the solution where the points are abundance, but now, but now the tail have much more error, so they're not squeezed. So it's not squeezed here and large here, but it's all as the same amplitude, right? So basically the fit is a bit less constraining, but we have better representation of the tail. No? All the points are basically inside the, the three sigma bound here. So these are the, so the, 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 the orange, the dark orange and the white, and the light orange are one and two sigma bound. So if I enlarge this to three sigma, I will also get this point and that point. No? So all the points are inside the, the solution of the GP now. So it's a better representation at the expenses of not knowing anymore what's the parameter are. So I don't know anymore at the generative model, but I have a representation that is probable, let's say. I have a, an higher dimensional representation. And we can do exactly the same for the dot product. And now you see the dot product is much better because it has an evolution that the other one doesn't have. So the other, the prior distribution of the other was flat. So basically you prefer a constant than, a, than, a, than an evolving solution. But if I use this, now you see that I get the line. So this is my line, right? And, <laughs> and if, I, if I show you the final result, then the dot product, which is the correct generative model, blah, 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 gets the correct solution up to a very small scatter. So in the end, the GP can give us a better representation. To the so it can give us a better probabilistic representation of the data set, let's say, of the data. But at the expense is that we lose complete, if completely we lose information about the parameter space. So in principle, you can still use this to estimate parameters, but not parameters that are not observable. So the parameter of your generative model, which are only inferable through the probabilistic Monte Carlo procedure, will not be uh, constrained by this because they are not included, let's say. And with this, I, I stop here. And uh, in the next lecture, we will see how to use this, combine it with Monte Carlo to estimate parameters. So there is a way to use this to reconstruct functional behavior and then combine uh, the statistics. So what you can do basically it's use the idea of Monte Carlo anticipate this. So basically from this you get probability. So at each point, this, you have a set of PDF that is continuous and represent the function, okay? So each of the points that I represent here as GP is a probabilistic distribution. So basically what I have, I go here. So, so basically what I have is that the GP give me this, right? So in Monte Carlo, what you typically do with parameters that you don't uh, sample in the likelihood maximization is to, derive them by propagating the sample of each of the parameters that are independent, no? So here we do the same. You can do the same by propagating the sample of this into other functions. So you basically can get from this P of F of Y. And using this, you can get parameter if you have combination of function that you can bound to a parameter. So if you have a, imagine you have a parameter that you know, for example, you have a parameter uh, theta that is, uh, defined like p of I don't know zero. Now I'm I'm just so then if you have these two functions you can get theta, right? So even though you have only this, you can still get parameter estimation if you have a way of using the functional shape at each point to get the parameter somehow with a radio with a combination of uh, function. But we will see this tomorrow. So for now I stop here. Yeah. Puedo concluir.